Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. Church, the word of the living God reads for us this morning. And immediately he, Jesus, left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. May the Lord our God bless the reading of his word this morning. Amen. Lord, along with our brother's prayer, I continue to pray that you would bless the preaching of your word this morning. Understandably, we have not ceased to worship you. We are still worshiping you. The Lord is your people, is your sheep. May we, by your grace and for your glory, submit ourselves to your word this very hour, at this very time, we have come together as your people to proclaim your excellencies and to hear your excellencies, that we would not just be hearers of the word deceiving ourselves, but to be doers of the word. Lord, may you show us through the preaching of your word, Lord, may you, you, you bless me that we would see a, a, a great vision of the glory of Christ and that as his people, we would continue through what we see here to deny ourselves to deny our feelings, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and to follow him. Lord, you have said in your word that those who know Christ ought to walk in the way in which he walked. May we see the way in which our blessed Savior walked and may we seek to follow that path. The path of life, the difficult, narrow road. Lord, may you bless us to walk side by side together. May we worship you in this time, submitting to your word trembling before your word, humbling ourselves before your word, and not privately seeking to judge. Lord, may you bless us in accordance with your truth, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, church, continuing in the gospel of Mark this morning, uh, if you would recall in the context of where we are, the Lord Jesus has been greatly attested and witnessed to in being God's promised anointed one, or his promised Messiah, his promised Christ. For many different texts and promises in the Old Testament scripture, uh, which we have personally here uh, viewed from different texts, from the Psalms, uh, from the prophets Daniel and Isaiah and Malachi, there's certainly many more as all of scripture points to Christ. And from them, church, our God promises that there would be one who would come to reign as uh, ultimate king over all the nations, as righteous king over all the nations. He promises that it would be through this one that our our God, that he would reconcile fallen man, us sinners and lawbreakers, to his righteous law, to himself. He would reconcile us and bring us to himself through him. And beloved, the righteous kingdom, he promises, this righteous kingdom of God that is founded upon this one is promised to never end but to last forever, to never be destroyed. While other imperfect kingdoms come and go in this present fallen age, other nations fall and rise. Rise and fall, but this one will not, because its king will never fall. Its king will never fall. He rises to continue to rise and to stay there. He never falls. And so, church, as King Jesus has been greatly attested to in being this promised one, we have seen him coming forward proclaiming the gospel of God in the establishment of God's kingdom in him. You recall from Mark 1.15, he, he openly, publicly proclaimed that time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come. Repent and believe the gospel. Turn from trusting in yourself. Turn, repent, and believe this good news. Believe this gospel. And furthermore, we have seen him call his first disciples, his first servants of the kingdom to himself. And then as we saw last Lord's Day, they followed him to Capernaum, 
where he was teaching in the synagogue there on the Sabbath. And we saw the king then put on display his authority over two things. Two things we saw him show his authority over, primarily over all doctrine or over all teaching, and then over the demonic as well, over all demonic forces. You remember as he taught church, the people there in the synagogue, as they heard his teaching, were astonished at it. They were taken aback by his teaching because he didn't teach as their other teachers. He didn't teach as their other scribes did. You know, he wasn't just telling them, well, you know, this is what Rabbi such and such says, and just teaching the opinions of man and so forth. But he was teaching with real authority. You remember we mentioned the Sermon on the Mount along in this. Over and over again there in the Sermon on the Mount, you hear the Lord Jesus teach with authority and say, you've heard that it was said of old, that you've heard uh, the men of old teach you this in this way. But I say to you, I say to you it is to be this way. Beloved, the King of the nations, the Lord Jesus teaches with all authority on the very basis of himself, because as the God-man, he is the very foundation and origin of all truth itself. John 14, 6, church, he is the truth, right? That's who he is. He's not like us who just can have the truth or possess the truth. He is the truth. In his divine essence, he is the truth. He is where truth comes from, the very origin of truth. For in him, Colossians 2, 3, not with him, in him are hidden all, all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And beloved, it is that that comes out of his mouth at all times. Nothing but the truth comes out of his mouth at all times. He, the Lord, speaks the truth. He declares what is right, Isaiah 45, verse 19. And thus, church, because of that, everything that comes out of his mouth, everything that comes from him is to be submitted to by all of his creations, especially his people, but by all of his creations. Everything that he says is our creator, our Lord, our master is to be submitted to. It's not up for debate. He didn't create us church and uh, then give us the right to define what is true for ourselves. We don't get to decide what is right and what is wrong. We don't get to decide what is uh, good and what is bad. No, that's already been eternally known by our God and he reveals that objective truth to us in his word and supremely to us in King Jesus. And so beloved, if someone ever disagrees with Jesus, they're wrong every time. Every time you disagree with Jesus, you're wrong. You can bake on it. You're wrong every time. There's never a time when you can disagree with Jesus and come out right. You'll always be wrong. He is the foundation of all truth, which is why he teaches with authority. And then, church, you recall, as this was going on, uh, there was a, a man who was demon-possessed. The text said he had an unclean spirit. That's a synonymous term for having a demon here in the Gospel of Mark. And while everyone else was so astonished at Jesus' teaching, not even knowing who he was, you remember this man, or this demon within him, rather, he knew exactly who Jesus was. Mark 1, verse 24. You recall he said, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And then as we'll see more of this in our text for this morning, but in not associating himself with the demonic or the, the kingdom of Satan in any way, the kingdom of darkness, uh, Jesus immediately rebukes the demon within the man, calling it to be silent and to come out of him, to which the demon immediately did. Immediately did. You know, church, King Jesus didn't have to set up shop and perform what some would understand as an exorcism or something like that to try to get this uh, demon out of this man. No, there wasn't a process our Lord had to utilize in this. All he did was have to authoritatively speak to his created being that was in another one of his created beings to come out and it obeyed. Because he has all authority in heaven and earth. Come out. And it did that. It obeyed. It came out. That's the authority our king has below. He's the preeminent one. First place with no close seconds whatsoever. And certainly then from this, you recall, as our Lord did this, those who were astonished at his teaching there became even more astonished. I mean, you can imagine being there, and you would be as well. Even more astonished, questioning amongst themselves, verse 27. What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey. And then from that, obviously, as verse 28 expressed in the last verse of our text, last Lord's Day, we read that his fame then spread everywhere throughout all the region of Galilee. 
And church, that's where we find ourselves this morning, in the context. Jesus has shown by his very own works who he is as the Christ, and in doing so, his fame and popularity is quickly rising. And church, again, that you know, as I mentioned last Lord's Day, that's not necessarily because people want to actually hear and receive the truth in, in why his fame is spreading. But as I noted then, it is because he is teaching powerfully and with authority, and because he's actually and verifiably casting demons out of people. So, you know, of course his fame is going to spread. Fame can spread from that even amongst sinners and people who don't want to hear the truth. Even if it's not for actual reasons of truly wanting to follow him, people are going to come because they're going to want to be healed. It doesn't mean they want to be reconciled to God. It doesn't mean they want Christ in their life. But they come for selfish reasons because they just want in and of themselves to be healed, regardless of that fact. Or they're going to want to see people to be healed. You know, sinners like to be entertained. Sinners like a show. And in knowing that he has the ability to supply their need in that, people are and will seek Jesus simply for that. And certainly they still do, they do this today, church. People still seek Jesus in that sense today. I mean, church, that is the heart of the so-called prosperity gospel and any form of it, because its, it's message generally is come to Jesus and he'll eventually make all your life better, right? You'll have all the health you want, you'll... you'll prosper in health, you'll prosper in wealth, it's all yours. You can live your best life now in this age in that sense. And church, biblically, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's not true. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Lord's will for us in this present age is not that all of his people would always be healthy and happy by worldly standards. Now, we're not told or promised that again in Scripture. But what we are told and promised is that his will for us is that we would be holy as he is holy. That we would be set apart from this world as he is. We would be holy, set apart from this world and its rebellious desires unto God and his, his desires of truth and righteousness for us. That we would, in accordance with God's word, church, be conformed into the very image of Jesus himself, into the image of the Son. Romans 8, 29, that's what he has predestined us from all time to be conformed into, into the image of the Son. That is his will for us. And so, with that understanding, church, what I primarily want to put on display from our passage this morning and how the narrative presents itself is the primacy, the primacy that proclaiming and teaching the truth of God's word should have in our lives in ministering to one another and those around us, ministering to neighbors around us in our community and in surrounding towns and so forth, the primacy that the preaching and teaching of the word of God should have over against just like just in and of itself, by itself, helping and caring for people physically alone, as seen in the miracles and the physical healing of Jesus Christ, our Lord, here in this passage. That is primarily, there's other things we're going to address, but that is primarily what we're going to see here in our verses for this morning, that in light of every way, church, in light of every way that we can and, yes, are commanded and ought to help people, in light of every way that we can and ought to help people, it should never be void of, or, or take precedence over the teaching and proclaiming of God's word and his truth in Christ Jesus. And so, to begin this, we'll see this beginning in our text, beginning in verse 29, that as Jesus' fame is spread all around the region of Galilee, he and the disciples with him at the time, they leave the synagogue, and they go immediately into Simon's house. That's Well, Simon is, is the same as Peter. They go into Peter's house, Simon's house. And then as they enter into the house, we're told in verse 30, that Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a fever. And you know, certainly because of what they just saw, we're told that they immediately told Jesus about it. They immediately told him about it. And, you know, as a side note here, church, we, I will say we should find it interesting that Peter had a mother-in-law, uh, that Peter had a mother-in-law in his life. That, that does mean that he had a wife. Peter was married. Uh, because, you know, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Peter was the first pope of the church, Yet they also strictly teach that anyone in the priesthood, including the Pope, cannot be married. They must take a vow of celibacy, yet their first Pope, as they say, was married. He had a wife. He didn't take a vow of celibacy, which is just a huge contradiction in their line of thinking. You know, the Apostle Paul <clears throat> tells us, church, that in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in the latter times, there would come deceivers teaching doctrines of demons. 
Doctrines of demons, a church, a part of that, is that they would forbid marriage. <clears throat> that, that is one of the doctrines of demons that will be taught in these latter days, as the Spirit expressly says in 1 Timothy 4, 1-3. Forbidding marriage. And it is a doctrine of demons, certainly, because marriage is a good thing as defined by God. It's not good for man to be alone. That's why God cre uh, created uh, Eve out of Adam. It's not good for man to be alone. He, he made a, a suitable helpmate for him. Beloved, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord, Proverbs 18, verse 22. And so amongst other things, for sure, yes, there are definitely other things, uh, but the Roman Catholic Church definitely needs to recant that. Uh, Simon Peter wasn't the first pope, uh, first of all. That's not biblical either. We'll, we'll address that later, uh, later in another sermon. But if you're going to say that, if you're going to say that he was the first pope, you should probably at least have some consistency with how you're functioning and teaching and how you're your so-called first pope function. You know, why would the first one get a wife but no one else gets a wife after him? That doesn't make sense. But then moving on from that church, what we what we see here is that upon being told of her, of the mother-in-law being ill with a fever, uh, verse 31, Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and then she began to serve them. Immediately healed, she began to serve them. All Jesus did, church, was go and touch her. Right? He just took her by the hand and lifted her up, and that was it. That was it. The Lord is continuing to show his authority here. Beloved, he's king of the nations, he's king of all creation, and he shows his utter authority here over even disease and the effects of the fall and sickness by simply touching this woman, and the effects of the fall and sickness are immediately gone. All he did was touch her, and it's gone. So church, in contrast to you know, what much of people who claim to have the gift of healing do today, Jesus didn't have to do all the showy stuff, right? He didn't have to do all the showy stuff. He didn't, you know, have to swing his, his coat jacket around and knock everyone on the ground like Benny Hinn. I, I don't really honestly know what such a thing helps anyways in, in doing that, getting knocked to the ground by a coat jacket. But nevertheless, he doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to do any of the showy things. He simply goes and touches her and picks her up, and she's healed immediately. Do you know, church, neither does, as we see here, neither does he even have to sit there and pray earnestly that God would heal her. It's, it's very much a means for us as followers of Christ in, in seeking healing today and seeking the healing of others, physical healing and so forth, praying to God for the healing of, of one another. That's a proper and good thing for us to do today as we entrust ourselves to our sovereign God and his will. Jesus doesn't have to do that. As God of the flesh, he simply heals her immediately by his own authority, and by his own power to do so. And then, beloved, further in the text, we read in verse 32 to 33, that later on, that evening at sundown, uh, the whole city then, and, you know, yeah, that, that's possibly hyperbole, but, but as it is, this would at least then be a good majority of the city. A good majority of the city were gathered together then at the door of Simon's house for Jesus, bringing to him all who were sick and all who were oppressed by demons. And at that time, we then read in verse 34, our Lord healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And we read that he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Not permitting them to speak because they knew him. And you know, church, there in not permitting them to speak, we just continue to see the great authority and power of our great God and Savior, King Jesus Christ. Church, they could not speak unless he permitted them to. They didn't just have free reign to do that. They would only be able to speak if he permitted them to. They didn't have authority to speak on their own. And you know, church, honestly, it's, it's, it's the same still even with us. Proverbs 16, verse 1 says, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. The plans of heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue belongs to the Lord. And so uh, while we do yes, while we do decide what we want to say, you know, we're not robots and so forth, we do decide what comes out of our mouth, yet at the same time, we wouldn't say anything that we say, we wouldn't say anything that comes out of our mouth that the Lord did not sovereignly ordain it and permit it. The answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Just the same, we see that authority over the demonic in As I said before, church, I... 
uh, last, last Lord's Day. I, I do believe in respect to the demons that he would not permit them to speak because he didn't want any confusion as to who he is and who he is aligned with. As I mentioned then, later in this very gospel, we'll see that the scribes uh, were spreading rumors that he was casting out demons by the power of Satan. And he will specifically address and correct that lie then, but just as well, he doesn't allow the demonic to add to that confusion in any of his ministry whatsoever. But also along with that church, Jesus would just as well uh, at different times not only not permit demons to speak, but he would also tell certain people to not, to not tell anyone who, uh, who healed them and so forth, to not go tell them that, uh, of what happened in the situation. The Lord willing, we'll see that specifically next Lord's Day as he says that very thing to a leper that he heals. He tells him to not go tell anyone, but then he does go tell everyone. He tells the man not to say a thing about him doing it. And as I briefly mentioned last week in this church, I, I don't believe, as some have suggested, that Jesus is trying to keep who he is a complete secret in this, uh, what's called like the messianic secret and so forth, if you've ever heard of that, that he didn't want anyone to really know who he was as the Christ. But because if that was true, then he wouldn't have been so public with his ministry, number one. He wouldn't have been so public with his ministry. He wouldn't have publicly healed and so forth. And church, he certainly wouldn't as well have told the high priest later in this very gospel during his trial that he was indeed the Christ. Mark chapter 14, verse 61 to 62, he asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus says, I am. He, he admits to me, not to mention in John 4, earlier in his ministry, he tells the Samaritan woman that he is the Christ as well. So he wasn't trying to keep that a complete secret or something like that. Now that is, it's, I would say that's a ridiculous claim. But I will say, along with this, uh, was there a big misunderstanding from many of the Jews on what the Christ would do? Was there a big misunderstanding on that? Sure. Uh, they imagined that when the Christ would come, he would bring the kingdom of God in a physical sense, and he would overthrow Roman rule, and the Jews as God's people would be on top again. Right? That's the idea they had. We see that brought about a little bit in John 6, 15, after the feeding of the 5,000. In John 6, 15, after he does feed them, we read that Jesus perceived that the people were going to take him by force and to try to make him king. He perceived that the people were going to try to take him by force and make him king. Speaking of king in that physical sense of overthrowing Roman rule, physical oppression, and so forth. And so because of that, we read that he left and he withdrew and said, because, brethren, again, as I said last week, that's not how our Lord's kingdom grows. That's not how the kingdom of God grows. Uh, if it was, his servants would be fighting. He tells Pontius Pilate that verbatim. If, if his kingdom was of this world in that sense, his servants would be fighting. Uh, but our Lord's kingdom doesn't expand by force and might. It expands by him conquering sinners' hearts through the gospel. It expands by him conquering sinners' hearts through the proclamation of his word of truth. And so what I believe is going on here when Jesus tells people to not say anything, and you know, I, I do think it's probably also what's going on here in him not permitting the demons to speak as well uh, in the context of this whole city being gathered around and so forth. What I think is going on here is not that he's just trying to keep this thing a complete secret, but that he's trying to keep unnecessary distractions and unnecessary hindrances away from what he's really come to do, right? Which is not bring in a physical kingdom, as many thought at the time, nor is it to heal every sick or every demon-possessed person around, but it's to preach the gospel. It's to preach the word. It's to preach the kingdom of God. And while he is God in the flesh, church, humanly speaking, is truly man, you know, if everyone begins to try to take him by force to make him king, or if everyone begins to always crowd around him so that they or their loved ones can be healed, then he's not going to be able to do that very efficiently. He's not going to be able to go forth and preach the word where he wants to very efficiently as he desires in different places. You remember churches I quoted from last week in John 18, uh, there before Pontius Pilate again, Jesus made very clear that he came to bear witness to the truth. That's why he came, to bear witness to the truth. He came to bear witness to the kingdom of God, to the gospel. He didn't, as, we continue, as we'll continue to see in this text, he didn't come to heal everyone. He didn't come to do that. He didn't come to just get this big following and grow his fame and just being this really wonderful healer guy. Again, church, in, in contrast to the heretical prosperity gospel, which is no gospel, 
Jesus did not come to make our lives all physically better. He didn't come to do that. Not in this age. Not in this age. Now, sure, will that be in the new heavens and new earth and the consummate kingdom of God? Sure. Yeah. There will be no sickness on that day, no disease, no effects of, of sin in that great and glorious eternal day in the consummate kingdom of God when our Lord returns. The church, that's not promised in this age. It's not promised now. The church, because it's not promised in this age, we don't see Jesus spending all of this time trying to heal every single sick person around him at all times. Beloved, the sinless one, the perfectly righteous one, though he heals those around him as he is ministering the word, though he heals those who, who are around him in his vicinity, out of compassion for those hurting around him where he is currently ministering at, that still was not his primary focus at all. That was not his primary focus at all. There was something much more important to be done than that. And he makes that very clear himself in this next section. Verse 35 to 39, as this is going on, the whole town is surrounding him. They're, they're wanting to uh, be healed. The next morning we read, rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Simon and those who were with him searched for him. They found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And so church, firstly, what we see in the text from this, you know, we don't see our Lord rising early in the morning to plan out his next healing meeting. We don't see him rising early in the morning to plan that out and plan out his next revival service to really get this thing going and continue to make his fame rise amongst this Galilean, uh, this, the Galilean area and so forth. No, but he goes away from it all, and he goes out to a desolate place. He goes out to a desolate place, that, and that word can be translated the desert. It can be translated the wilderness, but it implies a place that is desolate. And so he goes out by himself, and he does so for one thing only, church, which is, which is to commune with his father. He goes to pray. And I've mentioned this truth from the pulpit before, church, for different reasons, but you know, this is how we ought to start our day as well. As followers of Christ, this is how we ought to start our day as well. It's exactly how we should. And no, church, I, I don't mean in getting up as early as our Lord did. Uh, this, this word translated early in the morning does specifically mean the time period between 3 and 6 a.m. Uh, but I'm talking about beginning our day in prayer. Beginning our day in prayer. We should definitely be beginning our day just as our Lord, communing with our God. Beginning our day in prayer. Along with this church, King David says in Psalm 5, verse 3, Psalm 5, 3, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Beloved, again, so should we. So should we. You know, all I'm saying here, church, is that we should begin our day as Christians. That's all I'm saying. We should begin our day as Christians. Begin our day communing with our God, delighting in Him, praising Him, making requests on behalf of others and for the continued grace and strength in that day to put sin to death and live under righteousness. Because church, understandably, any day we live in is not our day. It's not our day. It's His, it's his day that He's given to us. It's His day that He's given to us to glorify and enjoy Him in and to obey His commands out of our love. Beloved, prayer is a vastly important means of grace and service to our King. And even he, the God-man, the King of the nation, shows us that here, going out to a desolate place to pray. May we follow our Lord in this church, starting our day as Christians. And then what we continue to see, brethren, from this is that as he is praying in the background of all this, what is going on back around Peter's house is that everyone from the night before is back out looking for him. Where is he at? Right? There's more people to be healed. There's more people that want to see people be healed. There's more people that want to see him do something amazing. Cast a demon out. And so Simon Peter and those who were with him, uh, presumably James and John and Andrew, they go searching for Jesus because of this. And you could also translate that as it says they, they went and hunted him down. They searched for him. They hunted him down. And upon finding him, they bring that very fact to him. 
Right? Everyone's looking for you. Essentially, Jesus, what are you doing out here? The, the people are calling for you. The people want you, Jesus. Church, you know, Jesus doesn't say, great, let's get this thing going. Let's do this thing. No, he, he essentially says, well, you know, guys, we're moving on. We're moving on, guys. We're going to the next towns. But Jesus, there's some real sick people back there. They're, they're looking for you. I know. But we're going to the next towns, like I said. We're going to the next towns that I may preach there as I've already preached here. Because that's why I came out. Church, he came to preach. That's what he says. He came to preach. That is why I came out. Again, he came to bear witness to the truth and preach the gospel in the kingdom of God, not just go out and heal every sick person. Because, brethren, as sure as a fever and many different illnesses can be very harmful to our bodies, as sure as they can be very harmful and very uncomfortable to our bodies, taking us to our death, the fact still remains, church, that there is a much more harmful illness if you'll allow me to use that word in that way. Certainly sin is not a physical illness in that sense. But there is a much more harmful illness of sin that if not cured by the Lord Jesus will lead us into God's punishment for eternity. Will lead us into hell if we die in our sins whether we have the greatest health or not. Beloved, it's just a fact in that that you can be physically healed and still go to hell. You can be physically healed and still go to hell. You know, not every person who Jesus healed got converted. We don't see that through the Gospels, that every, every person that Jesus healed gets converted. And so while helping people physically is surely an important concern in our life, church, as Christians, it wasn't our Lord's primary concern, and neither should it be ours. It wasn't our Lord's primary concern, and neither should it be ours. And now, I know someone on the outside could hear me say something like that and twist it, and to me saying that helping people physically just isn't important at all. But that's not what I said. That's not what I just said. What I said is that it is an important concern. It's a very important concern, as it should be. Beloved, this church and its members have helped many people physically and financially in our community, not asking for anything in return. So it's a very important concern that we seek to follow. But what I did say is that helping people physically should not be the primary concern. The primary concern. Because the primary concern, beloved, should be just as our Lord's was in proclaiming his word of truth in the gospel. Church, we have to understand this. We have to understand this. We have to acknowledge this and walk in this truth. Because as human beings who are body and soul, body and soul, the only way the soul ever gets truly helped is through being raised from spiritual deadness to life by the power and grace of God through the gospel, through his word. Healing the body doesn't heal the soul. Healing the body doesn't truly heal the soul. Only the power of God's grace in the gospel does that. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation for all who believe. It's the power of God. God exerts his power through the gospel to save his people, to heal, truly heal their soul, and making them a new creation in Christ Jesus where the old passes away and the new comes, reconciling sinners to himself through his word of truth and the gospel. The gospel is God's power of salvation. Everyone who believes upon Christ, everyone who entrusts themselves to the God-man who lived in perfect righteousness and died on the cross for the sins of his people, rising from the dead to ever save his people to the uttermost. Those who believe upon Christ, believing the gospel, they're forever saved by their God in him. By his wounds, they are truly healed. By his wounds, they are truly healed. And beloved, as Paul asks later in Romans 10, 14, how are they to believe in him of whom they never heard? How are they going to believe a gospel they've never heard? How are they going to believe in a Christ they've never heard? How are they to hear, he, he continues, how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to hear with it if someone doesn't proclaim that truth to them? Well, church, the implied answer is that they won't. They're not going to believe in someone they've never heard of. They're not going to believe in the gospel if they haven't been told the gospel. Which is why Paul says a few verses later in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Church again, 
People will never repent and believe the gospel if they never hear the gospel to repent and believe it. It's just a fact. It's just a fact. It'll never happen. So, you know, people can set up their quote-unquote ministries, churches, they want to call them, where all they do is just help people physically in different ways. They care for the sick and the poor and the helpless in different ways. But church, if you're not doing that, with also alongside that, the presence of the truth of Jesus Christ being proclaimed, then that is not a ministry that will ever truly help someone in the sense of giving them that which is the utmost of their need. It will never truly help them in the sense that it will never give them that which is the utmost of their need in the gospel. Because again, the utmost of their need is the truth. And in how our God has created this world to function, beloved, no one will ever know the truth that they never hear. No one will ever know the truth that they never hear. They must hear to believe. You know, along with that, there's, there's that phrase, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Preach the gospel, use words if necessary. It's, it's nonsense. It's unbiblical. It makes no sense. Uh, though, yes, church, it is mightily important on how we live and display gospel truths in our lives. Yet just the same, we will never be able to just influence someone into the kingdom by merely being nice to them and so forth by just helping them physically and being nice to them and so forth. And that alone, without telling them the gospel, will never influence them into the kingdom, will never influence uh, them to repent and believe the gospel. Church, you will never nice someone into the kingdom. You're never going to nice someone into the kingdom. It's not going to happen. Which is why when we do help people around uh, out here at, at Christ's King Reformed Baptist Church, as we ought to love it, and following our Lord, it never just ends with us just seeking to help someone, and that's it. We're seeking to express the gospel to them. It's why we tell them to come to the church and speak with us because we want to speak to them. Because we understand that in having these problems, there's also some spiritual problems going on as well. And we want to give them the gospel, and we want to lead them in the truth, to help them in the way of following Christ as he has created them. And we pray, would, would call them out of darkness to serve them. It's never church. It's... It's never just, here you go, and, you know, we'll see you later. Here's your stuff. Here, here's what you, you, you know, you needed, and see you later. Uh, because, again, here you go, and see you later will never truly help someone. Not truly. And along with that, church, you know, the Lord taught this truth very clearly in a parable in Luke chapter 16. I'm going to read the whole parable. You can turn there with me if you want. Uh, it's Luke 16, verse 19 to 31. We read there in Luke 16, verse 19 to 31, that there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom. We're talking about paradise, the heaven, the presence of God, place of the righteous. Now, the rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment. And he lifted up his eyes from that place of torment and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and pull my tongue, because I am in anguish in this plain. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your, life, your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you're in anguish. And it's not, just to make a comment on that, it's not you know, like that the rich go to hell and the poor go to heaven and so forth. Lazarus, in being rich, didn't use it to the glory of God. He didn't feed poor Lazarus. Lazarus was hoping in God. So now him, in being treated and oppressed in that way, and in seeking to serve uh, the Lord his God, he is now at Abraham's side, and, and the rich man is in Hades in torment. Continuing on, <coughs> he says, And beside all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. The rich man then said, Then I beg you, Father, I beg you, Abraham, send him, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Verse 29, But Abraham said, "They have Mo Your brothers have Moses. 
They have Moses and the prophets, meaning they have the word of God. They have the scriptures. Let them hear them. And the rich man said, no, 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 Father Abraham. You're not getting what I'm saying. No, Father Abraham. If someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. They will turn and believe if someone goes to them from the dead. So here talking about the most spectacular form of a miracle or the most spectacular form of a healing and raising someone from the dead. And the claim here is that someone would most definitely repent if they saw someone raised on the dead. This great, if this great healing happened, they would repent. On the basis of that alone, they would truly come to God. But beloved, since our Lord knows that no one will ever repent and come to him, unless God grants it through the receiving of his word, of the gospel, he ends this parable in Abraham telling the man in verse 31, Abraham tells this man, who says, no, if you send him back from the dead, they will repent, verse 31, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Because church, apart from being born again through the living and abiding word of God, 1 Peter 1.23, apart from that, you will continue a sinner will continue to suppress the truth they know by their unrighteousness. And they'll just come up with some foolish excuse to continue to reject what they know. Which is why a sinner dead in their trespasses must be born again. As we mentioned two Lord's Days ago, we must be effectually called by God to then truly repent and believe the gospel. Church, that only happens through us actually hearing the gospel. Again, that, that happens only through us actually hearing the word of truth that God then uses as the means through which he does this wondrous work of conversion. So, beloved, if they, get, if they don't believe through hearing Moses and the prophets, talking about the Old Testament at this time, through the scriptures, if they don't believe through Moses and the prophets, and how much more even today, with the fullness of God's revelation in the New Testament, and seeing what the uh, Moses and the prophets pointed to in Christ, and the fullness of light in scripture in the New Testament, if they won't hear through that, if they don't hear from the word of God, then they will never truly hear it. Never. Ever. You could heal people all day. You could raise people from the dead all day, left and right. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter a bit. They must come to him through the proclamation of the truth. Which is why then, brethren, in, in already proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God and helping many there in Capernaum, here in the context of where we are back in our text in Mark, and already proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, helping many there in Capernaum, in accordance with the Father's will, he was not to just stay there and set up camp. Right? He'll, he'll come back later, and we'll see that. He'll come back later to Capernaum as he continues to move around, and we'll also see that he actually lives there. He, he, he lived there for some time, had a home there. But he moves on to proclaim the truth in the surrounding areas as well. And as he did, we read there in the last verse of our text that Jesus went forward to continue to teach and preach in their synagogues, and then in continuing to show forth who he is as the king of the nations with all authority to compassionately minister to those around him, he continues to cast out demons from people as well. In church, as Christians, as Christians, which means we're followers of Christ, we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, we follow him, we seek to walk as he walked. As Christians and as a corporate body under the headship of Christ, we should model this as well in our approach to ministering to those amongst us. We should definitely pray for those amongst us in our community, in our county, right? As God has providentially placed us here in Myrtle Springs Church, we, we do have more of a responsibility uh, to those here and around us more than anyone else in the world. We have a responsibility to those closer to us in the vicinity. And as we seek to help and support those around us in any way that God providentially brings us to, praying for them, helping them physically, financially, and so forth, beloved, we should also be able to do that while bringing the gospel to bear on those opportunities as well. Church, we haven't just been called to pray. We haven't just been called to pray. We haven't been just called to give to the needy. But we've also been commanded to give them that of their utmost need, which is Christ, which is the gospel, which is the word of truth. And so, as we bring this to a close, church, I know I've alluded somewhat to this in certain comments I've made uh, but I'm not going to get into like a full cessationist argument uh, in this context talking about the fact that men today do not possess the miraculous gifts of healing as our Lord and his apostles did. Uh, I've done that elsewhere in other sermons. You can go to the sermon of 1 Peter 4, I believe it's verse 10 and 11 on spiritual gifts, and, and I do mention that there. 
But church, we are commanded to pray for healing and so forth, but nowhere are we taught in Scripture to go to seek to cast out demons and to cast out diseases from people. Uh, that is not taught to us in the apostles' teaching. In any of, of the New Testament letters, are we taught how to do that in the Christian life or, or taught to do that in the Christian life? Now, God certainly still heals. Yes and amen. God still heals. He can do whatever he wants to. But no one today has that specific gift to where they can just heal anything and everything immediately as our Lord and his apostles did, just as we say our Lord here in the text. So church, pray for healing. Pray for healing. Pray for healing as commanded and taught. Then entrust yourself to your faithful creator while doing good, whether he determines to heal or not. Church, pray for healing and trust him with the results and come what, and, and, and what comes. And then if you want a demon cast out of someone, beloved, preach the gospel to them. Preach the gospel to them because it's the gospel that is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. Right? The only way that person will ever truly be secure from demonic possession is if Christ reigns in their heart. Preach the gospel to them because Christ will never reign in anyone's heart if they haven't heard of him. If they haven't heard of him. Preach the gospel to them, church, because that's the only way they will ever truly be delivered from the power of Satan unto God from darkness unto light. As Christ is King, Reformed Baptist Church, may we conquer in Christ. And in our service and ministering to our fellow neighbors, may we properly uplift the primacy of the preaching of the gospel and properly exalt and proclaim the majesties of Christ, that our King would continue to ride, to ride through his creation and conquer the hearts of his people. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we bless you, we love you, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, may you do a great work in our heart in accordance with it. May we deny ourselves and follow our Lord. May we not be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. And may we follow our Lord, Jesus Christ, in seeking to proclaim your word in all opportunities that you give us to do so. For that is why he came out, and Lord, that, that should be why we come out. It should be the essence of why we live in seeking to glorify you and enjoy you seeking to follow our Lord, our Lord, who came to preach. Lord, may you bless us in the different aspects of our life. For certainly not all of us are going to be doing this from a pulpit. Not all of us are going to be doing this on a street corner and so forth. But may you bless us in the different aspects of our life, in our homes, with our family, uh, amongst our community and so forth. May you bless us to be those who proclaim your truth, who proclaim your gospel. King Jesus, that you would, as, as was already said, continue to ride through and conquer the hearts of your people. May your kingdom reign. May it continue to reign in our hearts and minds. And may it, may it grow more and more amongst us in this fallen, fallen present age in which we live. Lord, may you bless your name and hallow your name in our hearts and minds this morning. May you bless the preaching of, of your word to that end and the rest of our fellowship. May you strengthen us for this task to follow you. We pray this in your name. Amen.